And welcome to this edition of Hidden History Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel. I'm not sure that you can see me or not, uh, but you can definitely see Ray Smith. There good. Hello, Ray. How are you? I'm very good. How are you today, I'm, Keith? I'm good. I'm good. We're starting off a little bit different because uh, we've got a special guest that's going to share some photographs and talk about them today. So, Ray, why don't let's just get started. Why don't you introduce him? I sure will. I'll be glad to. We've got Don Honeycutt with us. Don is the uh, son-in-law of Ed Westcott. Uh, if we didn't have Ed Westcott and his photographs for the Manhattan Project, <laughs> we'd be at a loss to tell our history. So what we've done today is just ask Don to come on and share some of the pictures that he has. He's got a, him and Emily have a wonderful collection of photographs and, and many of them are not photographs that have been seen or been used a whole lot by, uh, by folks like me. So I wanted to bring some of that hidden history out uh, from Don's perspective about his father-in-law, Ed Westcott. So Don, anything you want to say to start us off and then let's look at some of them pictures. Well, yes, I'm happy to be here to share this uh, photo collection with everybody that might be watching. Uh, like Ray said, I'm Don Honeycutt, and I'm a native Oak Ridger, born here in September of 1944. The uh, Ed Westcott was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, to parents Lucille and Jamie Westcott. He had a brother named Hugh. This is the picture that's showing now. And at a young age, uh, Ed and the family moved to Nashville, and he got a job with the uh, Corps of Engineers. And this is the camera crew that Ed worked with. I don't have the names of all of these men and women, but he worked for the Corps of Engineers for a short period of time. And the Corps was closing their office in Nashville and came and asked him if he'd like to have an assignment in Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, why not? He said he was only 20 years old. He'd been married uh, uh, just about a year and, and he had a son named Jimmy or James Jr. So he went to Knoxville, uh, took a company car. Now, oh, let me back up. That's not the one. He took a company car and he was the 29th employee hired by the Corps of Engineers to work on the Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge. His job assignment was to photograph the bill and the four nuclear plants, the city and the daily life of the people. The next photograph, I was just gonna show you uh, some of the work that he had done before he went to Knoxville. This is Rita Hayworth that he photographed in Nashville, Tennessee as a young photographer. She was a movie star in those days. And this is Clark Gable, another movie star he had photographed. Now, this is the car he drove uh, to Knoxville, as I spoke before. He's holding a four by five format camera, a speed graphic camera with a flash, flash attachment. And that's what he made 90% of his photographs with. He also used a 35 millimeter camera as well. This is an early shot looking from what's the going to be the administration building in the foreground and the road running left to right is highway 61 that's the old highway that ran through this part of the country from clinton clinton tennessee over to uh, oliver springs and further west the v in the background is where blankenship field sits and the town site uh, jackson square is located today so when it, Mr. Westcott came, these are the photographs that he made. This is what he saw, the raw land that you see in these photographs. This is another shot of where dormitories are gonna be built in that particular area. Looking at it, you couldn't make heads or tails of it as today. Yeah. This is another view looking from up on the hill where the high school sits at the completed administration building and that uh, starting of dormitories on the left, the central cafeteria on the right, and the hole in the ground in the foreground is where town site, 
which it was called in those days, Town Site One, where the uh, Dean's Restaurant's located today and the other shopping areas. So this is the beginning of Town Site. Now, Ed made a lot of photographic uh, photographs using a helicopter. This particular one, you can see he's got his camera mounted in the door of the helicopter. And another type helicopter he used that he's using the four by five speed graphic with this particular shot. And his aerial shots are so good that you can zoom in on them and see the people on the ground. Now, this photograph is the first funeral home in Oak Ridge, a Sharp and Holly funeral home. It was located on West Tyrone Road. Uh, Abbott Laboratories came there later on. And most people think Martin's funeral home was the first funeral home. That wasn't the case. Martin's funeral home was had an ambulance service. And then when Sharp and Holly left, they built a building on the turnpike, which is there today, and started that funeral home. Now, Don, is, do you have a date? Do you have a date when that funeral home came in there? Do you know when it was? No, I don't. I don't have any date on that. It That's was right. probably 44, 43, or 44, late 43 or 44. Yeah. Most things came to life in 44. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is a group of people that are waiting to get in the warehouse to see an exhibit uh, of atomic energy. And they wanted to see if the people is interested enough to make a museum, which they were, and the museum became the American Museum of Atomic Energy, located in the old cafeteria building at, down on Jefferson Circle. Now, this was a kind of interesting picture. These uh, gals or waitresses, they're striking, AF of L, union strikers on strike uh, workers on strike for higher wages that's probably the one of the first uh, strikes there ever was in oak ridge uh, general groves didn't want to have unions located because they would cause strikes and hold up the production but apparently uh, i'm not sure what the date is on this this is the tnc cafe, cafe turner and capiello uh, this building is still there the one on the right where the garbage cans are sitting is where you go in the entrance of the soup kitchen today. And if you looked in the floor of the uh, building where these ladies are standing, you'll see the tile floor that it was in there in the beginning and it's still there today. Another interesting picture is the baby bath demonstration. They did a lot of things to try to help young mothers throughout the city on how to care for their children. And this looks like a uh, Red Cross worker of some sort that's illustrating this. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of these pictures are gonna be uh, uh, not in order of any sort. This is a war <laughs> ends picture, which most people have seen this picture. Uh, it went down in the square and these people were gathering, milling around. And finally the war ends newspapers came out and he kind of got them all together and made this photograph standing on the back of a flatbed truck. The boy in the front with the strap assert is David Alexander. If you look in his hand, he's holding money where he sold newspapers that afternoon or that evening. And he came to Oak Ridge a couple of years ago and I got him to come down to the History Museum and I made a photograph of him standing in front of this picture. He even looks similar to that today as he did then. Some of these other people we've identified as well. Now, this is the chicken farm, <laughs> which was uh, <laughs> located. Uh, let me see if I've got that. Uh, where is that? It was located off of, out off of Edgemore and they would raise chickens and they would sell the chickens to the uh, central cafeteria. So they'd have chickens. This is a, the uh, Elm Grove Shopping Center. Uh, you can see a lot of people was in there looking for meat. Meat was rationed. Looks like there is some sort of meat on the scales. And this is out at Elm Grove, as I said before. 
It also did a, a lot of varieties of advertisements for people. This is a photograph showing the uh, Venetian or blinds that you could have for the outside of your house. And he also uh, was good at posing people with his photographs to tell, tell or show the image. Now this lady, <laughs> we all know pressure. She's one of early Oak Ridgers and uh, she is just a wonderful person. Unfortunately, she's deceased now, but she came to, I'll tell you her name in just a minute. She came, Colleen Black. Colleen Black, you're right. She came with her sister and her mother and lived in Happy Valley, which was a satellite community for the workers that built the K-25 plant. And she worked there for a while and learned to be a, a, a leak detector. And later on, she met her husband, uh, Black, they call him Blackie, Clifford Black. And they fell in love and got married, raised children and lived in Oak Ridge. And they both are deceased and they're buried over in the cemetery. She was quite a in, enjoyable Look, person to talk to. Yeah, don't, don't leave that. Let me talk about her just a minute. She is the one that when Denise Kiernan called me and said, Ray, I want to write a book about the women in Oak Ridge. By the way, she had seen Ed's photograph of the Calutron girls on uh, what we call them now uh, on the internet. And she called and said, I, I want to write a book about Oak Ridge. So she did. I said, I'll be glad to help you I, and I, I'll introduce you. So all I had to do was to introduce Denise to Colleen Black. Colleen took over and introduced her to all of the rest of the women that got interviewed for the girls of Atomic City. And, uh, you know, eventually Colleen would go down to Panera Bread and take her ink pen with her and on Friday mornings and people would come by and bring Denise's book for her to autograph. That got to be a tradition. She sent me an email one time and said, Ray, you started a chain reaction when you introduced me to, Cole, uh, to Denise Karen. Colleen was a jewel. I, one more thing about her. When we did the movie, uh, the Lost World movie for the History Center or History Channel, we filmed inside her house. And that was before she went into a, a senior living center. And the lady from, she was from London that was doing the filming, just was so excited because when she got inside Colleen's house, and if you've ever been in there, you know it was a unique, de uniquely decorated house. But one of the things she had was a chair that was made to look like a high heel slipper. And you sat down in that chair with the heel being the part that would support the back. And that high heel slipper is in that movie <laughs> of, of the lost worlds because that woman just got carried away with Colleen Black. So she, you're right, Don, she was a special lady. One thing, uh, a couple of things she told me when she lived in Happy Valley, um, uh, Thomas, uh, what's his first name that started Wendy's? Um, Dave Thomas. He lived Dave, in Happy yeah. Valley a short time before he went to work for Rika's restaurant in Knoxville. But another interesting thing, she always has something funny to tell you, but they would ask her, what are you making out at Y12? And she'd say about a dollar and a quarter an hour. So <laughs> she had a sense of humor that wouldn't quit. She was a real jewel Oak Ridger yeah. for sure. Yeah. This is the shot of the community store in the corner of Jackson Square. They had two stores throughout the city where Razzleberry's ice cream is today. Uh, typical, uh, store for that era. You can see a lot of the crates outside and the taxi cabs would park to the right of that automobile and wait for calls. This is the uh, drain pipe going down the turnpike. It's just an interesting photo that you never see because there's no reason to show it except for something maybe like this. As there was always construction going on. Now, this is the Crossroads Tavern, a famous watering hole for the guys. When they got off at work, they would come there. 
It's uh, where the locket store used to be before Oak Ridge on the corner of Raleigh and the Robertsville Road. It's the building's still there today, but it's in shambles and it used to be, I think, an Asian uh, restaurant at one time. Well, this was a 1951 Ford at Oak Ridge Motors. Uh, Ed photographed just about anything you can think of. And these people are admiring the new car that came out that year. Cars used to come out in the end of the year, like uh, 1950 in September or so, the 1951 cars had come out. So it's a little different in those days than it was today. Now we had a, we are in a pandemic with COVID. Also back in the day, this is an iron lung that people used that had uh, polio. And if you got polio, you, you would go in this iron lung and help you breathe. Just quite different than today's problem we have. Well, this is a modern dentist office back in the day. Oak Ridge had a full dentist uh, office and dentist and nurses waiting rooms, x-rays, rooms, the whole whole gamut was here. And I'll tell you that wasn't pleasant to sit in one of those chairs and let that old uh, grinder grind on your teeth. Quite different than today. Today they can give you some of that knockout stuff and make you feel good. <laughs> it also, this is the way grocery stores used to display their products. A lot of them would stack up cans and jars and this is just one in one of the grocery stores of many that Ed photographed. Also, he did birthday parties. And uh, this is another example of a birthday party. And it, uh, it's just typical of Ed. He would get all these kids together and the parents in the background. Notice the Venetian blinds on the window. Uh, most people probably know Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was the ethereal uh, physics scientist leader for the Manhattan Project, but this photograph's a little different. Ed was in the guest house and Dr. Oppenheimer asked him for change for cigarettes. He said, yeah, I got them, I'll get them for you. So he went and got Oppenheimer some cigarettes and he sat, sat him down and he took this photograph along with some others. Oppenheimer is from New York and he was a chain smoker. And on the mantel, uh, right above his shoulder, this picture sits today in the guest house lobby. Well, this is the uh, bad beer that they got in Oak Ridge and they dumped it all out in the landfill, as you can see from this garbage dump. And then they took a bulldozer and covered it all up. Now this gentleman is um, let me get Edward Tiller, and when he came to Oak yep. Ridge at the X10 reactor room controls. Eleanor Roosevelt visited Oak Ridge, the Oak Ridge Institute for Nuclear Studies, and this is Dr. Dr. William Pollard uh, giving her a welcome. What you see here is an eye test for driver's license. Also, Oak Ridge used to have a safety lane and you were supposed to take your car to the safety lane and let it be checked for brakes and lights and turn signals to make sure that it was functional to drive on the highway. Family fun. It was uh, just about everywhere. These people are playing dominoes. The farmer's market was a popular place for people to go and get fresh vegetables. It was located at two or three different places. This one's off of West Division Road, which is not on a map anymore. It was uh, about where the um, Dairy Queen sits right in that area. Also, it was on Fairbanks at one time. These two guys are drinking a soda, but what's unique about this picture to me is look what they have in their fingers there, cigarettes, and they're drinking a soda. 
I just can't imagine how you could drink a soda and smoke a cigarette at the same time, but these two guys sure did. <laughs> okay, this is Fire Dog Chief. Now, Chief's got a kind of unique story for the early fire department. He uh, would travel from the town site on Tennessee Avenue station down to the Groves station and on down to East Village and get food from the firemen. And they took a liking to him and kept him. Unfortunately, uh, every time the fire alarm would go off, Chief would run and jump on the truck and go with him to the site. Well, he was at the uh, East Village Fire Department one time and the alarm went off and he jumped for the truck and missed it and they backed the truck over him and killed him. No. In the early days, my mother would tell me, said, get your toys you don't want we're taking it to the fire department and they would refurbish toys to give to children that didn't have a Christmas. It was a great thing that these firemen did. The food line for the African-American people in the Scarborough area, uh, Scarborough Hutman area that is, they had a full living facility. Uh, it was kind of low class, but they made the best of it. I might say if everybody that worked on the Manhattan Project, no matter what job they had, to me was a hero. Without everybody doing their job, I don't think it would have been a success. Just right. another building where you don't see much. It's right across from where the Civic Center is today. It was called the Furniture Exchange. You could go down and get used furniture or exchange furniture. Furniture. Those are hutments over there on the right that they used also for different things other than living facilities. Now, these people are waiting for the interest grand opening of the Miller's department store. And the word on the street, there was nylon, nylons for sale. We'll have to see later if that was the case. The <laughs> graphic shop also is another place in town that's not very well known. And I don't know where this one was located. Now, this is the Department of Health. Before this was uh, the Department of Health, it's where Noel Weather is today, across from the uh, shopping center by Weigel's. This was a field hospital that was one of the construction companies used. And also, I think the African-American men and women that lived in the Scarborough Village across there if they had uh, have any medical treatment, that's where they go to get it. Because in those days, segregation prohibited taking them to the normal hospitals to be treated. This is on uh, what we call town site two, the second section of town site. Henry's jewelry is on the corner. Now, that what's unique about this is Hilltop Market. You can see they displayed their cans in the floor like everybody else. But look at this self-service. This was the first refrigerated self-service, uh, I guess you call it uh, freezer-like, in Oak Ridge. It was at Hilltop Market, not at the AMP or the community store. Most people had gardens. Some called them victory gardens or cleaning up the yards because it's when they first built houses, it wasn't anything but just old rough grass and, and dirt everywhere. So most people had a uh, want to make gardens to live off the food they grow, grew. Now, this is uh, Senator Glenn H. Taylor from Idaho. I do not know the story of why he's on this horse in the front porch of the guest house, but it sure makes an interesting picture to look at. It does. <laughs> well, these items were confiscated due to the fact they wasn't allowed on the reservation in those days. Uh, no guns, knives, sword, rifles, transmitters, radio, or cameras, except for Ed was the only one at the beginning that was allowed to have a camera and no whiskey. But there was beer here, and I never have figured out what the difference of beer and whiskey might be, unless whiskey makes you talk more than beer would if you drank too much of it. 
But as the local boot, bootleggers would find, uh, locals would find the bootleggers, they found a way to get it back in here. A lot of times they put the, take dirty diapers out with them and put the bottles in the dirty diapers. Also, one man said he had a headlight he could take out and stick it in there. So they came out for different ways of getting their alcohol in on the reservation. This lady's receiving a lie detector test. She looks like she's scared to death. <laughs> This is um, a lot of the people in the early days that worked here had to have a lie detector test, depending on what area they worked in. Now, this is Mrs. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, old dog on it. I'm sorry, I've lost my place here. Oh, shoot. Oh, I'm, this is... Um, Mrs. Truman that visited Oak Ridge, Bess Truman. This oh, looks like it's okay. in a Semesto house somewhere, but I, I don't know where that one is. Well, you know which one it is, it's her? Yeah, the, I'm sorry, the lady right here with the pins on her left shoulder. Okay, that's Bess, okay. Yes. I didn't know she was ever in Oak Ridge. Yeah, well, we got proof of it right here. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Well, another birthday party. Well, These I, kids are having fun well, back outside. Back up to that one. Back, back up to that one one more time, if okay. you don't mind. All right, just hold that just a second. I tell you what, I'm going to do with this now. I'm going to send that picture to Clifton Truman Daniels. He is the grandson of Harry Truman, and he just sent me an email last night. He's got a lady coming in next week from Los Alamos and he wants me to give her a tour. So I'm going to send this picture to him and ask him if he can identify his grandmother. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Don. Move right ahead now. <laughs> uh, typical another birthday party. Ed loved kids and check out the chair the lady sitting in over here. That was a popular type chair in those days. And you can see the grass is not too much of a grass. Looks like something uh, wild growing there. But these kids are having a great time with their birthday party. Yeah. Now this is meeting uh, in the uh, Midtown Community Center in the big room that we call the Wildcat Den. That's the way this building used to look like in this day. It had a concrete floor. And those support posts are still there, but they've been covered with paneling being painted. And check the beams in the roof up there, how they're put together. Most all of those buildings in Oak Ridge was built with this type of structure. Hmm. This is Patricia Neal, an actress. When Ed had his stroke, he went over to Pat Pat Patricia Neal for rehab, and he heard she was coming in. So. We took this picture over and she signed it for him. And this picture's in the uh, Westcott Gallery in the History Museum. That's neat. <laughs> now this is the music man, Bill Pollock. He had Bill, he had Pollock sounds. What he would do would pipe music into the rec halls or the tennis courts. And also he would uh, play different types of music. And he had also entertainers that would come on uh, his program. Later, he had the music box for many years and sold records. The unique thing about the music box, you could go in and ask to listen to a record and go into a sound booth and listen to it. Uh, and if you wanted to buy it, obviously you did. Now, this is the first business that got a, a license, I guess you might say, to open in Oak Ridge. This is a Texaco station located on Arkansas in Tennessee, Arkansas on the Turnpike, excuse me, Nash Copeland, who had Nash Copeland's store in Oak Ridge and had to leave because of the project. He got the first choice of having a business, which he opened this Texaco station. And it sits, it would sit right behind uh, the Polly's uh, Market, I believe it's on the corner now. This lady's having some kind of medical test. Don't really know what it is and with this blood pressure or what she's having.
Now, this lady's been helped by these African-American nurses and aides. Uh, she's got a broken leg, left leg, as you can see. Oh, yeah, stockings were for sale on the, in Miller's department store, as you can see from this lady. Stockings in a box, box of chocolate would get a soldier a long way with these ladies. The first newspaper uh, was ran by the military for a short time, and then the Oak Ridge Journal came on, online, and Ed was a photographer who's leaning down there on the right. And that's Fran Gates, the editor at the very end of the table. One comment she made in an article, she wrote that everything was scrutinized, obviously, because of the secrecy. But she put out something in the paper that was fixing to happen before General Groves told about it. And she really got reprimanded by him over that. <laughs> Knoxville New Sentinel boy uh, selling papers there on the street in front of the post office. Just another example of the variety of photographs Ed took in his photographic career. It wasn't uncommon for people to stand in line. These people are standing in line to hopefully get cigarettes that was being sold at Williams Drugstore on the corner in Jackson Square. Now, these people are sitting on the grassy area where Armour Spray Garden is located today, looking towards the administration building with some word about the war ends. Now, this picture is um, Queen Frederick of, um, goodness gracious, I had it and I've lost. Anyway, she was a queen that visited here. That's Sam Suspiri, uh, head of AEC at the time. Oak Ridge Motors on the Turnpike, West uh, East End, you could get a brand new 59 49 Chevrolet car. This reporter's interviewing Dr. Compton. And you know, Ray, you may know this guy. He was the first uh, manager for X10, but I, I had his name somewhere and I can't find it. Do you know who that might have been? Uh, yeah, it starts with an M, but I, I cannot, I yeah. can't get it either. Yeah. I, I know who you're talking about, but I can't get it. But that's Compton is the second one there, right? Yeah, this the man with the striped suit on up and down. That's Compton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I, I could look up that name, but I can't remember it. I, it seems like it starts with a name, but I, I can't remember. OK, these are Ron Anderson employees uh, getting coal in their baskets. Uh, most of the heating in Oak Ridge was provided by coal heat, and Roan Anderson employees delivered the coal. And these guys are fixing to start the day. They have a coal, coal chute or a coal pile, you might call it, was over there on the backside of where uh, Kmart used to be in that area and had a railroad line that came in from Elza and brought in the coal cars. And that's where the coal was distributed, except for Townsite, they had a, their own steam plant and the coal would come in there for that particular area in Townsite. These are the, uh, the group of um, <clears throat> military police at roll call. The military police controlled the entrance to all the seven gates that came into the reservation. And their headquarters is located right across the street from where St. Mary's School is about where um, Applebee's is today. They had barracks there. Well, cigarettes is rationed, but you could get tobacco and these wrapping papers in this little machine and you could wrap your own or you could roll them up yourself. <laughs> this was a traffic, um, I guess it was a billboard Later on, it became a little different. Uh, they would post the number of accidents, and if they had a death, the red light would come on. Other than that, the green light would shine. 
secrecy so, was so good, even Santa Claus had to be searched before he got in. That's some more of edge humor. Yeah. This is when Senator uh, Kennedy and his wife visited X-10 in uh, February the 24th of 1959. That was before he was a, a senator. And you know, I can't not remember who this guy, He this was the uh, X-10 manager. Yeah, that's Senator. Alvin Weinberg. Yeah, Weinberg, that's correct, Ray, thank you. Now this man is uh, well known by all youth. And um, he, he came here and worked for the health and recreation department. And he also was the overseer of the Midtown Community Center Wildcat Den. And he had, um, you had to be a high school student before you could come into the Wildcat Den and have a little pass. Now this man's name is Shep Lauder. He was like a second father to all the kids. He kept order in the Wildcat Den. And when everybody would, uh, anybody would act up, he'd politely uh, escort him out the building. Most of all the kids respected him. Now, is that hat down at the Oak Ridge History yes, Museum? Yes, his hat, that hat is in the showcase in the entry of the Oak Ridge History Museum and uh, and some other information about the Wildcat Den as well. Shriners, uh, food baskets. Uh, this was at the Cold Storage Building located on Coal Yard Road. The building burnt down and uh, I think uh, Chin Properties has that building at one time. Tyndall's Building Supply was in there. These baskets were to be delivered to the needy back in the day. Now, if you got, wanted to come into the reservation, you had to get a pass. Someone inside had to arrange for you to meet at a certain gate and have a pass. This is Staff Sergeant Kennedy and Sergeant Bolin, uh, the badge and pass, making out, uh, as you can see, passes on their desk. Now this guy has developed a steam power station wagon. Don't know his name, just run across this photograph. It's kind of interesting. If you look, he's putting paper in the bottom to, to create <laughs> the heat to make steam for this contraption. This is the inside of the TNC cafe that Turner and Capiello ran on the corner I spoke about earlier. As you can see that red tile flooring is still in there. This is a serving line. Hmm. This is Town Hall located on Kentucky Avenue. If you'll notice those, looks like railroad ties in the middle of the road to separate it. They had a one way going that direction up the hill and then one coming down. I guess that was before they had opportunity to put lines on the, on the pavement. But this is where all the town uh, decisions came from when, when the uh, city was established. This is a Tulip Town Market in Grove Center. And the interesting thing that got my eye on this was look at what these two ladies are standing on, Perina Food, I believe <laughs> it is. And it wasn't uncommon for this many people to be in the grocery store. Now this photograph's got a line down through the middle of it for a particular reason. If you look to the right, you'll see the building, that's part of the U of K-25. That was classified and they cut the picture in half. This soldier is uh, speaking to the workers at K-25 uh, about buying bonds and also being on the job when they need to be. As you can see, he's lost an arm in the war. There was two or three that came and did talks for the uh, certain groups around town in those days. This is Victory Beauty Shop in Jackson Square. And look at the hair dryers. It looks like they're putting on space helmets to go out of space. But this was a typical style shop back in the day. Another picture of war ends. 
the striped boy is David Alexander again. I just realized today he got in two photographs and he's holding the money in his hand. People held up babies, it, just like these two here. It was just a little bit of everything. And this was in front of where the uh, Oak Ridge Playhouse is today. That was the Grove Theater in the background. Chapel on the Hill had many weddings. It was a church built by the army, used by all denominations. This is just a typical wedding. Even today, the uh, steps going into the building is a great place for a group photograph or maybe a wedding as well. Inside the church is about 95% original like it was. They changed the pews a little bit, put some pads in them, and they moved the organ from the loft, uh, choir loft down onto the main floor. And for some reason, I have lost my arrow here because I can't see. Well, Don, Don let me tell you, there you go. You got it. We, we've been going about 40 minutes now, so okay. we, we'll wrap up here pretty soon. But you've got some really neat images there. Uh, run a couple more, and then we'll put up, we'll wrap it up. I can't get to the arrow for some reason or another. Okay. Oh, there it is. Well, that's all there right. It is. No, there you go. No. That's a that's the other war ends. Yeah. Yeah. So well, uh, at any at any rate, I think we've had we've had a good show today. We appreciate you doing that, and uh, you've got some really good a really good collection of photographs. Let me mention that Ed has fifteen thousand negatives that are on cold storage in the National Archives. We probably and I'm guessing, Don, you may correct me. But we probably have a few hundred, maybe five or six hundred at most here in Oak Ridge uh, in various collections. Yours and Emily's probably being the most uh, prolific collection that we have. And we really do appreciate you sharing some of those images with us today. Keith, you, uh, you used some of these images when you made the war, uh, the Oak Ridge Secret City, the war years. And yeah, it was I, I know you appreciate that. It was interesting when I, when I first started working on that film, I had a, a fellow that worked for me and I said, you know, we're going to go down to, I want you to go down to the, uh, to the Oak Ridge library and uh, scan the eight by 10 black and white photographs. And we did hundreds, literally hundreds of them that they had in the, in the room in there. And it took him a couple of weeks to, to do all that. And he, he came back one day and he said, he, he said, I was, I was down there. And he said, a fella came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, what are you doing with my pictures? And it was Ed Westcott. This was not, but maybe a few months before Ed had his stroke. And right. uh, uh, I, I believe it wasn't long. I may, it may have been longer than that, but it wasn't long. And uh, yeah, I've always said, you know, if it wasn't if it wasn't for Ed Wed, Ed Westcott's photos and Bill Wilcox, I wouldn't have a career. So you know, <laughs> so yeah, we're all indebted to Ed, not just for not just for the the work that he did, but for leaving such a great legacy. Let me yes, let me uh, make one uh, more comment. Um, yes, Emily and I have both been to College Park and the one below Atlanta and scanned all the pictures related to Manhattan Project except the 35 millimeter film and their scanner wasn't working. But the images that Keith is referring to was given to the library and also the AMSI Museum by uh, Frank Hoffman. Frank Hoffman yeah. made a thousand images of various subjects and gave them to that because he was afraid that these images would be all gone and no one would have anything. And he's one that packed all of the images and negatives and everything up and sent them to the National Archives. I guess that's good, but if they'd still been here, we'd had a little easier access to them. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he, yeah, I'm glad he at least took a thousand of them and left them here. So uh, yes. I'll change my wording to say we've got at least a thousand of them here. So, yes, I, I think uh, we have somewhere around probably uh, 8,000 images in our database. And you give me a subject, I can give you a picture of whatever it might be. Uh, now, that, that's a tremendous archive that you've created there, too. That, that's good. 
Good yeah. Enough. All right. Well, thank you, Don. Thank you so much for sharing those with us today. I'm sure everybody's very anxious. I know I was excited to see some of these. I've never seen some of these before. That, uh, that's why I picked some of them. They, they would never fit in anything except what we're doing today. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. Ray, do we have somebody scheduled for a couple of weeks? We do. I've been talking with John Jefferson. He's the writing partner of uh, Dr. Bill Bass. They, they, Jefferson Bass is what they go by. And, and you know, they wrote, they've written several books, but uh, the, the one that they wrote about Oak Ridge, The Bones of Betrayal, is mm -hmm. uh, an interesting book. We'll, we'll have him talk about that uh, on our next uh, uh, on our next hidden history and Don by the way you showed a picture of uh, of the sewer line I believe running by the turnpike when John was here doing the research for that book he had heard that you could walk through some of the storm sewers in Oak Ridge and I'm thinking that I don't know whether that's the image you saw what kind of pipe that was but he literally got in the the storm drainage system up at Jackson Square, and he walked until he came out down near the Civic Center. <laughs> Let me elaborate on that a minute, Ray. Um, William Westcott, who's now deceased, one of Emily's brothers, met him and showed him how to do that. You could start on the <laughs> other side of the practice field on, and go yeah. underneath the football field and come out down there. And yeah, I, I didn't know William did that, but I, yes, that's did. great. <laughs> They're bigger pipes than those that you saw along the turnpike. Yeah, yeah. They, I'm sure they, I'm sure they were. Uh, evident, the story is that you could even ride a bicycle in them, but I don't know if that's true or not. I but at least he walked in them, and, and yeah, William showed them to him. That's neat to know. Well, Keith, we'll uh, we'll have John Jefferson on next, okay? All right, sounds great. And folks, thanks for watching. We certainly appreciate it, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.